two writers, one just starting out, the other a bestseller. Join James Blatch and Mark Dawson and their amazing guests as they discuss how you can make a living telling stories. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Hello and welcome to the Self-Publishing Formula Podcast with Mark and James and part two of our look at children's books, but this should be of value to you regardless of your genre because it's all about digital marketing. And um, we I promise I'm not going to talk about football because it's all done and dusted now. We have no idea. This is the 6th of July we're recording this. Glory could be now covering the United Kingdom, particularly England, uh, or it could be a hangover. So let's just park that and deal with it as the narrative unfolds in the future. Um, Mark and I will be back from New York, and I hope you joined us uh, uh, there in America. Uh, we we'll are uh, really looking forward to it from where we are now. It's very difficult talking about the past tense from the past. And uh, there's got to be a new language. I think, I think Douglas Adams did invent a new language because of all the time travel in his book of uh, he went there to do what happened or something. So You're floundering. I'm not floundering. I'm um, exploring narrative and language. I can, see the, I can basically see the cogs whirring in your brain. Yeah, but it's still Slow, early morning. Slowly. Keep going. <laughs> okay, so we, coffee. we've got this uh, focus on children's books, and we had a great interview from Laurie Wright uh, in Canada last year, uh, last week, I should say. You're right. There is a floundering going on. I'm too excited. And um, today it's Karen Inglis, who's uh, across the uh, pond in the United Kingdom, lives in London. And Karen has been plugging away at children's books for a few years. She's done a lot of the things that Laurie talked about in terms of the children's visits, uh, school visits and so on, and library readings. But she has also had a breakthrough and uh, we caught up with her at the London Book Fair. Uh, And it was great to speak to Karen because we've known her a couple of years. uh, But her face, you can see, is kind of lit up now because things have started to take off for her properly. Uh, She can fulfill that dream of earning her living through writing. And again, spoiler alert, it's AMS ads more than Facebook ads and more than YouTube, etc. Uh, and BookBub even, it's AMS ads that have been uh, the key breakthrough for her. So let's talk to Karen and uh, and Mark and I'll have a chat off the back. Yeah, we're tucked away in a little corner of the London Book Fair. Actually, coincidentally, it is kind of children's central. The stands around here are children's books and stuff, which is a coincidence, or yeah. sort of planned, or pretend it's planned. Um, Karen Inglis, welcome to the SPF podcast. How lovely to have you on here. Well, how lovely to be here. I regularly listen when I'm in the gym doing my um, my exercise. So very pleased to hear that you're looking after mind and body. <laughs> and you are a regular in the SPF community. You've been around yeah. uh, for a few years. We're we met you here probably three years ago, I think, maybe, first yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I actually was here when the Alliance of Independent Authors launched. I was here as well then. That's when I really got to, you know, know the community of self-publishing writers. So. Fantastic. Well, it's brilliant to have you on the podcast. And the reason we've got you on is to talk specifically about children's books. And, you know, it is one of those very often asked questions, particularly of Mark. He'll, people will listen to the podcast, they'll look at the materials and the courses and they'll say, does this work for children's books? And we know that the answer is that children's, a lot of the principles are the same, but there are specific challenges with children's books marketing, aren't they? So that's what we want to talk about. Yeah, Actually, yeah. why don't we start by you telling us a little bit about your publishing? My publishing, okay. Well, I first self-published The Secret Lake, which continues, by the way, to be my bestseller back in 2011. Um, and I'd written it many, many years before and stuck it in a box. I did that thing of sending it off to traditional publishers and then coming back and saying it's too traditional, it's the wrong length, it's this and it's that. Nice story, but. So it went back in a box for 10 years. And I'm a professional writer by day. How many of those letters did you get, do you remember? Oh, I'm not very patient, so I think about okay. seven or eight. Okay. I didn't send it very far and wide uh, before I. Yeah, and there were a couple of other things I had. And I just thought, actually, I could be at this all day. I'm going to go back to the day job where I get paid for my writing. And my kids were very small when I did that writing to begin with. So, you know, it was a time when I was at home more. Um, But I took a sabbatical from my consultancy work in 2010. And when I started looking around, I thought, well, I must put out those stories from my wooden box. And because what a shame. I used to look at the box and think, oh, what a shame. No one's ever going to know the story of the secret lake. What a pity. No one's going to know about Fern and Fox and the Hedgehog. Uh, And when I pulled them out and started looking at them, I think, actually, these are good, but they need some more editing. And then I went online and I discovered people talking about this thing called CreateSpace. 
And the more research I did, and um, the more I realised, actually, I can do this myself. There's nobody I can see in the UK doing children's publishing. There's someone called Joanna Penn living over in Australia who seems to be doing it, who seems to be English, that confused me. Um, anyway, I did huge amounts of research in the Create Space Forum and decided I would do it myself. And uh, the first thing I released was the Kindle, uh, sorry, was the Secret Lay in print and on Kindle. And that was in the very, very early days when none of the tools were around to help you create your mobile files. Probably when CreateSpace were pre-Amazon, when they were their own company? Um, I think they were joined up with Amazon at that time because there was a CreateSpace store. I don't know. I don't know what the background was. But all I do know was it was a very lonely road at the time. Yeah. They were mostly adults doing self-publishing and certainly no children self-publishing in the UK. So so that's why that's where it all began. So and that, and as I was doing it, I created my blog called selfpublishingadventures.com where I was sort of recording what I was doing for my own benefit as much as other people's. Yeah. To help other people. Yeah. Those pioneers back yes. in the day, as yes, say. Back in the Even day. though it was really only about five minutes ago. <laughs> I right? know. So, but that's how it is in the self-publishing world. Yeah. Things move quickly. Yeah. Um, and today, Karen, you've got a reasonable handle, I think, on the challenges of... of children's books and it is different from fiction books. You often look at people writing romance and thrillers and think you have it easy. Yeah, but what I think that you mean. Do you yes. think that? Yeah. Well I don't think you have it easy in terms of the, the writing, it's difficult for everybody. In terms of the process for creating your books, it's no different whether you're a children's author or not. Obviously if you're if you're doing picture books you've got to get your head around the whole colour picture book side of things and in images and all that kind of thing which again is a lot easier today than it used to be when I first started doing this but the biggest challenge and the biggest difference for self-publishing children's books is compared with self-publishing adult books is getting your book to mark to, into your readers hands uh, and the principal reason for that is that your buyer is not the reader your buyer is the reader's parents and so I think what I'm very jealous of and I keep thinking to myself I should write young adult, <laughs> is yeah. that that you don't get those impulse buys that you will get, you know, if you if you suddenly do a deal or you, you do run some Facebook ads and target people, they might take a punter on you even they haven't heard of you. Uh, if you're an adult, I think it's far less likely with children's authors, um, partly because, apart from anything else, um, a lot of children's book buying, um, A, um, what well, happens in print, but that's, that doesn't stop you advertising them in print on Facebook, for example, but B, that parents often buy based on personal recommendation from their own kids, from other parents, um, and so it's not in there, you know, it, it's not, it's far less likely they're going to just say, oh, that looks like a good book, I'll buy it for my child, as it were. Um, so it's more of a challenge, yeah, most definitely. So it's, it's, it's another layer to get through. Um, and as a result of that, um, and as a result of the fact that most children read in print, most children under 12 read in print, not on e-books, you... My experience is you need to go out and meet those children. You need to go out and do school events, face-to-face -face events, book signings in bookshops, that kind of thing, um, which is fantastic. I love doing it. It's a lot of work setting it up, getting into schools, creating your brand, getting known. Um, and, you know, it's not. There's no sort of quick win on that front. So you've got to really enjoy it. You've got to really believe in yourself, uh, and you have to be prepared to put a huge amount of work into that. So already we can see some quite stark differences in the way that a lot of fiction books are marketed because I think a lot of fiction writers will now no longer do physical appearances and book tours and so on. They're quite well understood to be time heavy and not yeah. particularly returning uh, no. value very well. Yeah. Whereas in your line, it is important to get yourself there yeah. because... As you say, Facebook, I mean, does, does Facebook advertising simply not work at all for children's books, or is it something that has a place? It might have a place. It might be that I didn't quite find the right place, but I do know that when I tried it, Facebook just ate my money, and it really did. I mean, I don't use it anymore. I did try it way back in the early days before when Facebook advertising first became available, back in 2000. And 12 or 11 or 13 or so, I can't remember when, when I, you know, I tried some little ads, uh, but I just found it's too easy for it to eat, eat, eat up your money. Um, I, and that's not to say I won't try it again. Now I've got a wider range of books, maybe I'm a bit more savvy about it, but I know from talking to other children's authors who sell a lot that other than this one, I think I know of Facebook ads have worked. I just, you know, I haven't found that it, it's a good spend of my money. Most what age range are your books 
they, they go by accident rather than design. I write across a range of ages. So I've got picture books for age three to five, six. Uh, and then I've got chapter books for age seven to eight and seven to ten. And then The Secret Lake is what they probably call a, a short middle grade novel, which is sort of age eight to 11. And actually, the great thing about that for me, coming back to school visits, is it means that when I do a school visit, I can often see the whole school in a day. I can, and, and that was a complete accident. So even though I don't write in a series, which I think, coming back to the traditional ways of selling more books, that is probably very good advice for somebody if you're going into children's writing. If you write a series as with, as with adult books, you're going to sell more books. I, by accident, seem to have written across the age groups, and it's sort of worked for me going out and doing those physical events. And I think I'm starting to see now um, online that that's having some crossover as well, um, and being smarter about advertising in the backs of the books or the other books. Because, of course, children get older. So exactly, exactly. Uh, and actually, interestingly, my latest book has just come out, Ferdinand Fox and the Hedgehog, which is a picture book with some fox and uh, hedgehog facts in the back, is selling really well, both actually online and face to face. Um, and in the back of that, I've got all the other books. And it occurred to me, gosh, actually, you know, I, I could be at the beginning of their family. You know, that you know, they've got all the different age groups. Well, they probably have older siblings and things like that. So, what's driving those online sales? You think? Um, I'm doing a bit of advertising on Amazon, which I wasn't doing before. Well, I was doing it in the states. Uh, and that worked in the early days. Now I think it's become very, very competitive. And although I, I, I don't lose money, I would say overall I've probably broken even. Um, but the Amazon UK advertising has really been a, a huge success for me so far. And I think, I mean, it go, I, I really do think it's because The Secret Lake is such a good story. I mean, not to, not to sort of brag too much, but it was considered by CBBC to be made into a, you know, the head of independent commissioning read it and, and recommended I send it in to the BBC, and they did look at it. Um, and when I go to school events, it's my bestseller always. And as a result, it's got, you know, not, nothing like Mark. I've got 46 reviews, most of which are five stars. They're all organic. They're all very genuine. And that, I think, when you, you know, when people find it, when they see it, and then they read about it, um, which AMS advertising has la allowed them to see it online, they are buying it in quite large numbers now. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. so so far we've got physical appearances in schools, yeah. Facebook advertising not so much, AMS ads working, particularly yeah. the UK ones, which are only recent, yeah. recently opened up. Yeah. So, so by by the time I know we're recording this in advance and when it's yeah. going to go out. You know, perhaps we could chat before you put it out to see whether that's all trailed off. I sort of do, almost don't want to jinx myself because I think, oh, I wonder how long this is going to last, you know. Uh, but, but it's we'll working at the moment. And what about a mailing list? Do you have a mailing list? You know, is this, again, the problem with not having uh, your readers yeah. who've got your parents. Well, exactly. So the re I, I, I do have a mailing list, but actually I've got a much bigger mailing list for my self-publishing blog um, uh, than I do of for writers. My, yeah, of writers. And that's been built up gradually, organically over the years because I have a huge number of people coming to my self-publishing blog. Um, and so I, I do have for them, and I do have for the children's side, but I've built it through things like Insta Freebie in the early days, which I quickly came to the conclusion fairly quickly that a lot of them just want free books and I'm not sure what the value of that is. So I'm slowly, um, when I get the time, trying to find ways to expand that online mailing list by, for example, having links uh, in my book, to, but it's to parents. I have to couch it very much. Before you sign up, you need to be over 13. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. Um, and again, I just, I know it sounds pathetic, but it's such a lot of work, children's books, that finding the time to sit down and then come up with some emails to parents that don't sound like actually you're just trying to sell me your kids' books, you know, yeah. is quite difficult. And so I've had to focus more on getting the books out there, getting my school visits sorted out. And whereas the the fact that a child gets older can be an advantage in that if they start with your youngest book, there's a possibility they'll latch onto you as an author and 
go through your series. Yeah, if they're older. But if they're older, we're it's also, a moving target. And the problem is the parents join your list with their children exactly. at a certain age, and suddenly the children, it's irrelevant to them. Exactly. The children are it's a kind of, it's a move, yeah, exactly, it's a moving target. And I'm, I'm presuming, uh, interestingly, back in the early days when I first did that Facebook advertising, when I think it was 2013, I remember thinking, well, if I was targeting people who say their kids are eight to 12, uh, how is, is Facebook? Is Facebook adjusting that every yeah. year? I've no idea, you know. Um, and so, you know, there was, I remember reading in the day, well, actually, they're going to target people with 8 to 12. That's only because they volunteered that they've got kids aged 8 to 12. And you could be missing out on a whole load of yeah. people. So, you know. But, yeah, it's a moving target. It's just it's just a different world, really. The, yeah, um, and as we stand at the moment, Mr Zuckerberg has been uh, giving testimony in Congress, and who knows whether that type of information won't be held by Facebook in the future anyway. Yeah, you know, How yeah. old our children are. I mean, we're in a very f a fluid uh, moment. I yeah. mean, there's no doubt that targeting will still be very much possible. But, again, probably easier for people selling thrillers and romance, etc. in history yeah. than it is for selling children's yeah, books. Yeah, yeah. Let, let me ask you a little bit about the physical appearances you do then. So for some children's authors listening to this, watching this, they may be a little daunted at the prospect of turning up in a school. Um, how would you get the gigs and what do you do? What do you, yeah. what do you say? Okay. So first of all, what I did originally, and I say this, and I, it, it, this is all going to be laid out in the book I'm bringing, that will be coming out around the time of this podcast, is start local. Don't you know? Start local. Find a school locally with um, uh, and target whichever the age group for your book is. Get in contact with them, and I would probably say I wouldn't make a habit of this, but to begin with, probably offer to go in for free and just say, you know, I've, I've got a book out. Could I come and offer a free session with your children? Um, and you know, you might take a few goes to get that. Or, or actually, my first ever gig I did was in my local library. Uh, and uh, I was terrified. It was, this, it was a reading of The Secret Lake, and um, they put flags up, and they said, there's tea and biscuits. They were very sweet. And I was thinking, oh, God. And, and actually, the perfect number of people turned up. There were seven children and seven parents, right. and then the, the librarian staff in the background. So it wasn't too many, but it wasn't too few. It wasn't nobody. Um, so that's a good one. Local library, you know, they often have story times. So I think what you want to do is get, get, get to know practice first before you think you can charge. Um, the other interesting thing was one of the first schools that I contacted, which is local to me, which is a very high fee-paying school, um, said, yes, you can come in. We, we won't. And I, of course, I said, I'll do it for nothing. And they, sent, they said, well, can you come in and do our year, whatever it was? And it turned out their year, whatever it was, two, three, had six different intakes. And so they wanted me to come in on for six different sessions in the, in the school library. And I thought, well, that's a bit of a cheat. But then I actually thought, actually, it's a really good opportunity for me to, practice, to see what works and what doesn't. So I actually had this crash course going in, and I worked out, because you, the great thing about when you first do it is you realise, actually, that reading, that I need to skip there, and I need to stop there and ask them some questions, and blah, blah, blah. Of so, experience of doing that reading. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like anything. You know, you've got to make it, make it a bit of variety in there. Yeah. So you read chapters of the book or yeah, yeah. Book. So, talk, so, talk about it as well yes I have a I have a, uh, a presentation I have slides okay so I, I talk about being you know being an author I show them where I work in my office I show them my cat Misty who's always walking around all over my work because you've got to sort of engage with the children as well and you ask them questions about what books they like why they like reading um, then I will um, tell them a little bit about the background for whichever book it is I'm talking I'm, I'm presenting to them how I got the ideas for it show them some photos then I'll do a reading uh, I then show them how I work with my illustrator, D uh, Damir, who lives over in Bosnia. So I've got some pictures of me sending him stuff back and forth and how we came up with the covers. So I mix it up, I make it really interesting for them, and then I always allow time for questions. Yeah. So inspiring, hopefully, a new generation of authors as yeah, well. Yeah, absolutely. That's important to you as, yeah. as trying to sell your books. Basically. Yeah, oh, absolutely. I mean, I just, you know, again, I have a background in A, writing, teaching English as a foreign language, so I did all that training in terms of how you engage with an audience. You don't want it just to be, I read my book, ask me some questions, and then we all go home. You've got to keep the audience engaged, yeah, with different things. 
So some real world appearances, which is a little bit different from the advice that's often given to authors, where we can happily do most of their things in their pyjamas from home, but getting out there is important if you're a children's author. And what about some um, media appearances as well? I'd imagine if there's any opportunity for local radio or something yes, like that. Yes, I mean, I've done, I've done the traditional PR in the sense of whenever I launch the new books, I would contact the local newspapers. Um, and get articles in there. Um, I had um, them sat there one or twice, once or twice they'd come down to the school and taken photographs. I mean, there was one time with Ferdinand Fox and the Hedgehog actually where this fantastic little boy with cerebral palsy um, was, he, by the end of the day, he'd written, using eye t- technology, he'd written a story of, Ferdinand, of, of a fox. Wow, inspired uh, by Yeah, inspired by Mark Mir. It was um, fantastic and I can't remember actually whether they had come on that day or whether I'd told them about what happened and they asked to come down and take a photo of me with him. I can't quite remember which way around it worked, so that was a few years ago. So that traditional side of things, I think it's good to do, uh, to establish your local brand, really. I'm, I'm well known now, and I've been contacted by local schools to go and do things like judge poetry competitions. Okay. Um, and I've appeared at the Barnes Children's Literature Festival each year since it's been running. Barnes being a borough in London. Yeah, where Barnes, live. where I live. And they've launched three years ago the largest London children's book festival. I mean, really big names, Jacqueline Wilson, you know, the whole lot. And in fact, I've got a session with them um, this year in May on self-publishing, children's oh, yeah. self-publishing. Yeah. So, which brings me on to your book. Yes, my book. So you've been, Am I allowed to hold this up? You can hold that up. Are you created this yourself? No, no, no. Uh, I use a professional okay. book designer. You use a professional designer for your books. So, um, Rachel so Launston. Entitled, if your people aren't necessarily watching on YouTube, they're listening. The title of the book is How to Self-Publish and Market a Children's Book. Yes, exactly. It exactly. Like, um, it, yeah. It's a fairly straightforward explanation yeah. of what the book's about. And actually, you know, the biggest thing in that is the market bit because the actual physical self-publishing side of things in a way that's been covered a million times by other people I will cover it anyway because my whole blog has always covered that and I'm very excited by the new tools that have come around that have made a lot of that so much easier things like vellum for example which obviously is for ebooks but I you know I go into my book why it's very important as well now yeah oh yes they do print sorry in fact one of my my Walter Brown and the Magician's Hat, which I recently changed the cover for after it won a, an award, uh, I did the print version of that using vellum because I wanted to try it out to see how it would be. Um, and I go into all that in the book because there are good, there are pros and cons of using, say, vellum for a children's book. You know, there are certain limitations. So for children's authors, because with a children's author, you've got to talk, think about what fonts you want uh, and that kind of thing. And there's some, some design limitations with that. Yes. But, you know, there are, the, the book goes into both the, both the process of self-publishing, the key ways to do it, uh, uh, and then the, the how to market, which is really what I think a lot of authors will benefit from. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, it does sound like, we, I, I came into this interview thinking that it is more of a challenge and it can be, to use an unromantic expression, a bit of a slog. It is, know, yes. A constant slog. Yeah. But that, that's basically what you're saying. With children's it works, work. it's, it's not necessarily the easy route to market. No. There's more physical work. Required. It is, and I think don't give up the day job, definitely. Um, if, if you can't afford to, don't give up the day job. I mean, I, I make money. I don't make huge amounts of money, although I think that with the Secret Lake taking off now, I mean, I have to ask my accountant, but, you know, um, but, you know, I'm not relying on the income, put it that way, so I'm lucky in that We're obviously sense. excited about AMS UK ads. I am, I am, because what it does is, and, and obviously I know most people watching this will know this, but a few might not, but when you walk into, say, Waterstones, um, those tables in the front of Waterstones, publishers pay to have the books put there. So, you know, there's no real point trying to get into those bookshops because the the distribution model is quite complicated. You you, you earn fewer royalties, lower royalties, but but you're not going to have your book on those front shelves. And unless you have a national advertising campaign behind you, people aren't going to go and find that your book tucked away on a shelf, most likely. They're going to be going for David Williams, Jacqueline Wilson and so on. And what AMS advertising does is it creates a level playing field uh, in that sense uh, because your book is just as visible as, as the other books which are in the sponsored ads. And then, then it all comes down to, well, it, is it a story that people want to read and what are the reviews saying about it? And I think... 
I think that's where, where the Secret League has finally been given it, given the attention it deserves. Having know. a good book is obviously a, Clearly. A, an important part of it. But yeah. I'm, I'm really pleased for you that in, all to hear from children's authors that AMS had to work at the moment for you, and I know you. So you don't want to jinx it, but um, you know it's it's this digital transformation that's made it possible for self-publishers yeah. to find get visibility. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, of course, I mean, it's a bit unfair that it's so much harder for children. To yeah, use. I mean, and that just I mean, I should add on the online thing, putting AMS to one side. I have done other things. There are children's websites where you can um, offer your book for review and they, they ask you to send it out to children who will review it and then the children review it through a sort of gatekeeper um, portal the parents were in, in charge of. Well, they stick the review on that website and that one's called Topster, T-O-P-P-S-T-A. And I've done that and had the reviews, but it hasn't really affected the sales because it's a little bit like a sort of five-minute wonder thing, you know, <laughs> if you saw what I mean, because... I think the difference with AMS are people are there buying books, you know, anyway. Yes, they're, they're, they're ready to buy. And we should say, because most people know what AMS ads are. Oh, sorry, yeah. We always get a couple of emails after saying, actually, what are AMS ads? So that's Amazon Marketing Services. It's Amazon's own ads platform. And most people know that, but not everybody. Yeah. Um, and yes, the great thing about, as Mark has said several times, is people are already in buying mode. Yeah. The time that ad is presented to them. Yes, so. and so... And of course, we did have, quite early on the podcast, we had Depeche Mandalia, we talked about marketing, um, I can't remember the name of the series. Oh, now, the story. Um, the where one your the name n- goes into the book. Yeah, your what's my name, name or what's lost my name, name or something. Yeah. My name is lost. Yes. lost or something. And, and he had great success with Facebook ads, but he, really going for parents, godparents. Well, friends. he did, but the difference there was it's a personalised product. Yes. And a so product. in a personalised product, my recollection is he had a massive bad budget as well. They had like millions of pounds. Um, and yeah, no, great product. But I think that is, if you can think of a way to personalise, perhaps it would work. Um, but I have the impression they did have a very big budget as well. Yes, so, And one of those things is that I think if you do have a huge budget, you can kind of maybe make it self-fulfilling by the more you spend, then, then the sales come and you can... Uh, so Karen, final plug for the book. Where can people find it? People can find it by um, going online, searching how to self-publish and market a children's book. I'm trying to remember the title. Yeah, <laughs> How to, yes. to self-publish and market a children's book. Karen yeah, Angus. and it will be available uh, in print and uh, as an e-book and I'll make it available everywhere. All good yeah. online retailers. Yes, yeah. Excellent. Okay. Karen, thank you so much for coming on to the podcast today. We don't get a lot of time to really focus on children's authors and and uh, yeah. it's, been, uh, it's been good, and for lots of people who write to us all the time saying, how do I market children's yes, books? I think yeah. this, this book is going to be very useful. I just remember one other thing I haven't said, which I don't know if it's going to yeah. muck up your wind-down thing where you put the music coming on, but never mind. <laughs> you can always hold the music. <laughs> hold the music, yeah. Local bookshops. Um, I would say, in terms of, again, establishing your local brand, do go to your local bookshops which have a children's section, and certainly I've been in my local Waterstones as well, go in and show them your book and offer to go and do a signing and to, to provide it on consignment because I certainly do supply my local bookshops. Um, so just sort of throw that Brilliant. one in. And just yeah. on that, that quote, you used CreateSpace back in the day. Yep. What are you using today? Are you still using? Yeah, I use CreateSpace for my Amazon, although I will probably move over to Kindle Direct Publishing for print yeah. as, you know, I'm still assessing it, but I think that's once that's up and ready. And then um, I use it, well, I, I advise everyone to use Ingram Spark for, um, the, for everything else. I happen to use Lightning Source because I've been around long enough that Light, Ingram Spark didn't exist when I first started out. But those would be the two routes. But then again, in my book, I give some alternatives for um, if, if your book sales take off or you know that they're selling very well, there are other ways of getting, you might be able to get more cost effective short print runs direct from printers yes. so but again I go into all that in the book and as well as the whole wholesale distributing to bookshops fact, thing. I was chatting to somebody yeah. yesterday uh, I think he used clay yeah, about exactly. places and tires in the UK I've got a, a yeah. 700 print run I think at about £2.50 a book yeah, yeah. So which makes it for clays, for clays is one of the ones I talk about because they also have a thing where they will They've got some arrangement with gardeners that makes it look as though your book, book, book is in stock or something. You know, I have, I've got that sort of all documented. So when, when the physical book's important, this is an area, again, we don't 
subject to a lot of discussion about because for most authors, the paperback e ebook and yeah. you know, the print on demand is all you need. But for yeah. children's books uh, in the States as well, we've mentioned a couple of UK printers, but it is definitely worth checking out those people who can do a fairly reasonable print run for you. Then you've got physical product to take to the schools and the yeah. local bookshops. And I should add at the moment, for my school stock, I use a lightning source, a stroke Ingram Spark. You can order those. Um, and um, that, that's fine for your stock. But I, I've got a feeling that when you're getting, if you start getting into ordering over 100, 100, 200, and you're using Ingram Spark, you might be able to find a better deal somewhere else. Yeah. But I'll, um, I'll, that will be, the detail of that will be in the book anyway. Um, yeah. We can start the music, right? Now I can start the music. Again. <laughs> so thank you very much. It's been quite noisy here, the London Book Fair, but I hope you've heard that. Yeah. Able to hear us clearly. So, Karen, again, thank you very much for doing. You're coming along for a drink tonight. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Excellent. And a pin, please. And a pin. <laughs> Mark Dawson's got the pins. Oh, has he? Yeah. So he'll oh, bring them I along. Have, so I have, again, here's my you virtual Mark, mug. I do have a mug. As soon as you see Mark arrive tonight, go up to him and ask him for a pin. Okay. Because yeah, he might oh. run out. All right. Okay. That's it. Thank you, Karen. All right. Thank you. I asked you. Um, I think when we were doing the some of the webinars when the Ads for Authors course was open, I asked you what course was most important people should go to first. And instead of you saying Facebook ads for authors, because it's like the main course that we deliver, covers mailing list and everything else, you hesitated to me and said, maybe AMS ads. And it's interesting to me that that AMS ads has gone from, in the time we've done this podcast, from zero to an incredibly important platform. Yeah, it's... 50-50, I'd say at the moment. I think they're both they're both important, and they can achieve. They give you different ways to reach readers. And, and, you know, fantastic targeting with Facebook, incredible targeting with Facebook. Um, but then on Amazon, you're you're able to market to people who are ready to buy there and then. So th there are pros and cons for both. Um, I mean, at the moment, yeah, I, I'd say Amazon is the one that I'm most interested in, um, and I'm fairly well plugged in now with the AMS team in London so I've had a couple of meetings with them um, I, I, they are we're talking quite a lot about some changes that might be coming reasonably soon to the platform making it a little easier for people to use it around the world so I'll say no more than that but um, it is it is definitely an interesting area that I think uh, there's there's lots and lots of potential for growth in the next six months to a year okay now I'm just looking up uh, whilst you were talking there because Karen has given me a landing page uh, let me just check this out for her book. So she's written a book which is called How to Self-Publish and Market a Children's Book, as we talked about uh, in the interview. And you can go to a landing page, which is this, selfpublishingadventures.com forward slash book release. So that's selfpublishingadventures.com forward slash book release. And uh, if the book's not out by the time that this uh, podcast goes out, you're going to go onto a wait list and certainly sign up for uh, information about that. Um, so yeah, so Karen's making really good progress in that. And it's great that she's following your lead, Mark, I think, and sharing uh, what she's done specifically for children's authors, which is very useful indeed. And who knows, we may even make a uh, approach to Karen one day and start incorporating some of that stuff into the SPF uh, official paid content because if it's um it's an area that could uh could do some specialist coverage i think yeah we'll see maybe good idea okay good right that's it well we can't talk about too much because we're in the past and this is going out in the future and we don't know the future do we well i do um oh, but you kept that I, secret yeah i've you know i've uh I have ways and means. So this is, this is going out on um, on the 20th of July. How many more attacks have there been in Salisbury since uh, since we recorded this? 16. <laughs> so, <laughs> Salisbury's if, been burned to the ground. If that turns out to be true, it's going to be a very spooky episode. <laughs> Good. Look, thank you very much indeed for joining us. You've got a, a last chance, I think, for probably in the next, next week to 10 days, we're going to choose our next uh, book lab uh, victim. So if you want to be in the hat for that, go to patreon.com forward slash SPF podcast and become a gold level supporter of the podcast. We really appreciate it when people support the podcast. So thank you very much indeed for your consideration on that. Mark and I will be back, I think, probably if uh, everything goes to plan we'll be back with our live from new york episode next week and i hope you can join us for that thank you very much goodbye you've been listening to the self-publishing formula podcast visit us at selfpublishingformula.com for more information show notes and links on today's topics you can also sign up for our free video series on using facebook ads to grow your mailing list 
If you've enjoyed the show, please consider leaving us a review on iTunes. We'll see you next time. Thank you.